Hello, folks, and welcome to our next panel discussion on engineering and surgery and intervention. Uh, my name is Mike Mika, and I'm a professor of biomedical engineering here at Vanderbilt, and I'm the director of the Master of Engineering in Surgery and Intervention program here at Vanderbilt. For those that uh, don't know about the program, it's a professional Master of Engineering program, and it uh, emphasizes advanced technical skills at the cutting edge of surgery and interventional technologies. We provide aspects of professional development. Uh, we also have a capstone design process that we have that goes over a complete semester. And then we have our, our hallmark is really our clinical immersion work. And so you really get a good sense for where these technologies are deployed. And so, um, you know, it's a, it's a great program if you get a chance to look at it. Uh, if you want to look it up, you can look it up at http colon backslash backslash vu.edu slash ESI. So with that background uh, done, in our previous discussions last spring, uh, we discussed a, a lot of areas where engineering was playing an interventional role and a role in within surgery and intervention. We looked at op open software developments. We looked at robotics, uh, careers in industry and entrepreneurialism. Um, we also looked at the entrepreneurial environment here at Vanderbilt. So today I'm uh, super excited to introduce to you two Vanderbilt entrepreneurs that are really hitting this hard out there. So um, with that, we're going we're gonna to see kind of what they're working on today. So let me uh, be begin by introducing our panelists today. Uh, first, we're going to have um, Dr. Duke Harrell, uh, Professor of Urolo Urology and Director of the Minimally Invasive Urolo Urological Surgery Robotics Program here at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. He's also CEO and CMO at Virtuoso Surgical. And we have also with us Dr. Bob Webster. He is the Richard A. Schroeder Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Vanderbilt. University. He's director of the Medical Engineering and Discovery Lab. He's also president and CTO of Virtuoso Surgical. So you can see the theme here for Virtuoso Surgical. Um, for those that don't know Bob and Duke Brett well, there's some bios that are going to be available online later if you wish to. So again, um, I appreciate you both for coming and speaking on behalf of the program and, and this interesting area that you're working in and your company and whatnot. So it's going to be interesting to talk for the next 30 minutes or so. We'll shoot the breeze and then we'll be done with this. Um, and you can go on about your day. I'm sure you're busy. So um, let me start first. I'll, I'll just jump right into it. Start with Duke. You know, you're running at about 200% effort right now in this pro <laughs> program plus treating patients. So a lot of folks probably don't know a little bit about your clinical background. They probably don't really even know where ro robotics and urology kind of cross over. So maybe you can just tell us a little bit about your specialty, kind of what you work on, the kinds of things you treat, and then maybe about a little bit about what robotics has done for you in your area. Yeah. Well, thanks for having us on, Mike, and uh, certainly it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I, I'm a urologic surgeon or a urologist, as we're called. We're really the, the surgeons of the genitourinary tract, both for males and females. Um, and so we address everything from uh, surgical kidney disease like tumors and cancers in the kidney, reconstructive efforts, all the way down through the bladder and the external genitalia. Um, you know, many of us subspecialize, certainly in the academic realm. Um, it's a great specialty, but uh, my concentration is mainly uh, in caring for patients with prostate cancer and kidney cancer and doing robotic surgery. Uh, but I also uh, uh, do a fair bit of endoscopic surgery. So the other thing that uh, urologists are known for is adopting technology. And so uh, we do a lot of procedures with scopes and lasers within the urinary tract, things for stones and tumors that are lining the urinary tract. Um, the background of... Uh, uh, robotics and urology is quite interesting. Um, uh, many of our listeners may not know, but the, uh, the current uh, robot that's referred to the most, the da Intuitive Da Vinci, actually emerged out of Stanford. It was not known as the Intuitive Da Vinci then. It was a, a prototype. Uh, it was just licensed out to a company, Intuitive, uh, and they were initially bringing it forward for cardiac surgery. Uh, they tried that and, and uh, had met with minimal uh, success. Uh, but along the way, they encountered urology, and it was about the time that there was a big push to do laparoscopic prostate cancer removal, and the robot made that a lot easier and simpler for people. I like to joke that I was amongst about 40 or 50 people in the world that could do uh, a laparoscopic prostate or a laparoscopic partial nephrectomy, and then the robot, uh, even the playing field. So good technology uh, advances surgeons' abilities. Uh, and so urology has certainly played, I think, a, an unbelievable role in the advancement of Intuitive. They've gone on to be over a hundred billion dollar company, uh, are thought of as one of the most important medical device companies in the world at this point. 
Um, and so there's a lot of history there. They've spread out into many other specialties at this point. So, so I'm going flip, flipping back to Bob here. So, um, you know, clearly you're you're in, you're embroiled in this entire field of, of robotics. So, and you you run a lab at Vanderbilt, and you're doing a lot of these cutting edge things in the medical this uh, medical engineering and discovery laboratory. Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, laboratory, kind of the core technologies, and kind of you know what are the impacts you're seeing in in um, the area as well? Yeah, yeah. So actually, my lab is um, it's totally focused on solving problems for doctors. So we look at the whole process of medical intervention, surgery. Uh, we go in with a completely open mind. We don't want to bring, uh, you know, a hammer and look for nails. We want to look for the nails and then design the perfect hammer to hit each one. Uh, so we, we go into the OR and we watch and we ask, we talk to the physicians. We ask them where they see the trouble spots in surgery being. And we'll bring any technology that we know of as engineers to bear to solve those problems. Uh, so that leads to what would look like on the outside, a pretty eclectic set of technologies and things that we do. Um, it's really today mostly centered around image guidance and dexterity. So those are two things we see that surgeons struggle with is knowing where they are and where they want to go because they see the tissue. They don't know what's beneath it uh, until they start to you know, pull things apart and cut into it. And we would like to give them that sort of x-ray vision with image guidance so they know where things are before they make the first cut. So that's the image guidance part. And then the dexterity comes about in surgical robotics. And we have a couple of different technologies that make surgical robots 10 times smaller than they are today on the market. And that's one of the things that Duke and I are commercializing through Virtuoso. Uh, so that helps surgeons deepen the body, go through tiny little openings, and then be able to move their tools around and have the dexterity they need to do complex procedures. Uh, so that, in a nutshell, that's my lab. It's about 10 grad students, uh, mostly PhD students. We have one ESI student working in the lab right now, um, and it's a, it's a great team. Yeah, that, that's great. Really exciting stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed by, you know, a lot of the work that you're doing it really does give almost like superhuman joints, you know, to the surgeons, allows them to do things that they really just can't do, you know. And maybe that brings us a little bit to the next question with maybe with Dr. Duke and this with, you know, so you're, you're obviously, your other hat that you're wearing is associated with Virtuoso, and it's going strong right now. So I guess, you know, can you tell us a little bit about the technology associated with it, right? What's your kind of role right now in the company? And then I got to ask, you know, the name, you, you, we got to know where the name comes from. <laughs> Every good company we got to know. So yeah, can you give us a chance to uh, give us a sense of what the company's about? Sure. Well, and, and certainly I'm sitting with the person that invented the base technology that we're, we're taking next? advantage <laughs> of. And, and so, you know, me explaining it is always amusing, but uh, basically we're using these nitinol concentric tube manipulators to, to scale down, in essence, small dexterous instruments where they've never been uh, put before. And so the example I'll use at Virtuoso is we do uh, within urology and actually many uh, surgical specialties, rigid endoscopy. And we have a limited uh, toolkit. Uh, our tools are very uh, uh, archaic for one of a better word, uh, single tool, no risk, little dexterity. Uh, we're really operating as we did uh, over the last you know, 30 to 40 years. And so with concentric tube manipulators, which I'll let Bob explain if you want a more in-depth explanation, but they're basically, we're able to scale down to a millimeter in size, give surgeons two hands at the end of a scope that is less than a centimeter, 8.3 millimeters is our standard outer diameter of our scope. We're able to bring two tools through this into a place where two tools have never been before, and then provide dexterous interaction such that we can do things like retract, uh, cut very precisely, have the tools interact. Uh, we're actually working on complex surgical maneuvers at the tip of the scope. And at some level, this is kind of what Da Vinci did with laparoscopy, but they need a football-sized workspace. We need a golf-ball-sized workspace. And I like the joke that we get there through a cigar-sized tube, which again, uh, makes us minimally invasive at a level that, that rigid endoscopy takes advantage of right now, but we can do even more. Uh, her, yep. If you were to estimate, like, what, what fold of, of uh, increasing capability is it giving you? Like, twofold, tenfold? What do you think in terms of psychiatry? Uh, I, I would say that the, uh, I, I don't know that I even want to estimate that because okay. almost every single surgeon who drives this technology uh, uses the phrase game changing. Um, you know, and, and I've been around long enough. I have enough gray hair as a surgeon to know that there are very few things that are game changers in what we do. Uh, da Vinci did it. Uh, there's a few others out there that are that I think are coming along, uh, and I think this is going to be one of those technologies. But of course, I'm biased. Uh, you <laughs> asked what my roles are. Um, you know, Bob and I rolled this company out of Vanderbilt uh, in 2016 and opened the doors in 2017, really because we 
we figured out that uh, modern day medical device industry doesn't do in-house R&D very much anymore. They look to startups and, and other things to de-risk technology along the way. And so we have been doing that over the past six plus years. Um, you know, I initially uh, uh, served as CMO uh, and then more recently over the past year, I've stepped into the role of CEO uh, and kept my role as CMO. So I like lots of hats. Um, and uh, it's been a great experience. We're really nearing uh, a point which, uh, again, there's certain inflection points for devices when you finish prototyping and you're getting ready to go into verification and validation testing, which is what we're doing right now. Uh, the next big hurdle is first in human uh, experiences and then onward, hopefully, to regulatory approval with uh, an IDE study uh, planned for 2024. Um, exciting. Yeah, um, just flip back to Bob. I mean, you know, do kind of let in with the with the, with the robotic um, type of robot that you're working on. But I guess you know, I'd like to also know, like, you know, how how did how did that all begin for you? I mean, obviously you have the technology. Tell us a little bit about that. But you know, how did it begin for you in terms of kind of recognizing that this could be you know play a role? And then um, and you, I guess you know, just to give a sense to the students out there that are thinking about you know you're, you're right in their wheelhouse in terms of engineers and things like that. You know, what's your what was your design process kind of like for it? Yeah, so the origins of this go all the way back to when I was a graduate student. So I was started off working on a super cool project, uh, steerable needles that uh, are still being worked on in the field today. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of citations, you know, it's made a real big impact in the field. But even back then in grad school, which is now 20 years ago, I could see that we were 20 plus years away, if everything went well with that technology, to getting to patients. And to me, that was too long to wait. So I was too impatient. So I didn't want to do the rest of my PhD on that topic. So I sat around scratching my head for a little bit, talking to doctors, observing surgeries, uh, and thought, what could I build that would have the same kind of curvatures that these steerable needles do in tissue, but would work outside of tissue and would be like da Vinci, but much, much smaller. Mm -hmm. So at the time, people were going, we're taking robots and putting them into the mouth, down the throat. And I thought, what's the next smaller thing? Well, let's go into the nose, maybe. And could we make robots that small? So it was really that push for me personally in grad school to find something that I was passionate enough about to do the rest of my PhD on that led to, and then talking with doctors and, and watching them do surgeries that led to the idea that we're now commercializing, which is, if you think about like a telescoping collection of tubes, like an old school TV antenna that you would pull out and extend, okay. Picture that, but now picture each one of those tubes as curved, uh, and each one of those tubes is very flexible. So it's made out of nitinol, same metal that cardiac stents are made of, or if you've seen the glasses that you can actually bend the frames and they pop back, it's that metal. So we make the tubes out of that, and if you picture putting a curved tube inside of another curved tube, if you aim them in the same direction, they'll bend to the side. If you take the inside one and you twist it on the back end and aim it the other way and it's still inside, they'll straighten out. And so you can picture if you grab them both on the back end and you slide them in and out and twist them, now you've got something that bends and elongates like a tentacle, but it's the size of a needle. It's, it's a millimeter uh, in diameter. So that was the key idea in grad school. And after I had that idea, I was like, yes, doing, finishing the PhD, uh, started my career at Vanderbilt. And the design process was me and PhD students and some master's students working in my lab looking at this and saying, okay, how do we advance the science? We need to model that thing. We need to write computer code that makes it move around. And we were doing all of that stuff, but we still didn't know where in medicine it would have a big impact. And we found out sinus surgery is a pretty small market and it might not support a whole robot. And right around then is when I met Duke and we started talking and Duke was looking around. He's like, this should have some really big impact on medicine. Let me help figure out how. And then he went away and came back. We met every week. And probably after a few months, he walked into the lab one day and he's like, we need to do whole lap. We need to do this prostate surgery procedure that we're doing now, which I'd never heard of. I was like, what is, what even is that? Right? <laughs> so there's no way I would have ever as an engineer come to that application on my own. Uh, but it was through Duke seeing what we were doing and finding the best thing for us to do in medicine that then set us on this path. And so then the design process was iterative. So we, we've we built probably 10 different versions of the robot that we have today over the span of 15 years, uh, making it better and better and better, more practical, uh, sterilizable, usable in the OR. And that was done in collaboration with graduate students who every step of the way were building those prototypes. That's and great. I'll add, Go ahead, sorry. I'll, I'll add, you know, we, as, as we realized that really putting to me, it was the putting these together. We had a robot that had these and they were very far apart and we were using as like a micro laparoscopic robot 
and sort of the idea of jamming them closer together. I remember asking Bob and the students, like, can we put these together and put them down a rigid scope? And they're like, well, yeah, of course we can. And Bob <laughs> always says yes. Uh, and, and, and I was like, well, giving us two hands at the end of that scope is revolutionary. Here's a procedure that needs to get better. But then it was the right after that was the realization that se almost every rigid endoscopic procedure would benefit from better tools. And if you look at like the Da Vinci intuitive, you know, they started out, they got urology, but now they've marched into gynecology, thoracic, general surgery. They're, you know, once you have a better tool, surgeons want to use it. Yeah, that's great. Actually, you're leading right into another question I have, which is it's a little bit of a, more of a, a, a description, I guess. You know, when you think about the master engineering program that we have, one of the things we're trying to do is really focus on clinical immersion and its value. So I, I'm going to ask, you, ask both of you this question, starting with Bob. You know, as far as like, you know, it's clearly impacted your designs. I was, I was wondering if you could speak to more what the students gain or what you gained, uh, uh, the actual seeing procedures, actually getting involved in that way. H how did it change your thinking? You know, how did, how did it influence your design process? You have a, a, a give a little bit of a little tactile sense for that? Yeah, well, it's, it's essential if you want to have an impact in the real world. So a lot of times, I mean, you'll go to um, conferences, meetings, and you'll see good presentations and you'll see okay presentations. And often what differentiates them is that clinical interaction that people have. So the people who have the clinical interaction and are in the ORs and are talking to the doctors, they design things that can actually be commercialized and ultimately used in patients. And you look at the, the other group and they're designing sort of Rube Goldberg, like we, as engineers, we interesting contraption, cool science, but you know, you can see that there's some fundamental limitation why it would never, never be used in the real world. And so that's the difference. I think if you want your research to have an impact on patients, on what doctors do and how doctors save lives, you got to be immersed. Yeah, it's, it sounds like that clinical workflow, witnessing it for yourself and understanding is so important. And that brings me back to Duke, actually, with respect to, no, okay, you're dealing with engineers. We're a bunch of geeks in general. Um, so, <laughs> I, so are we, so are surgeons. <laughs> That's right, right. We speak the same language in a lot of ways. I guess how does it how does it change your? I mean, you've talked about it, it, it impacting other fields, and you're seeing it quite frequently now. But I guess when you walk into the OR now, or your your even your uh, your residents do, they know what you work on and stuff like. Are the gears changing? Are the gears changed in terms of the way you think now? I mean, is there an aspect of how you address? <laughs> just look at your everyday practice, and you're just thinking completely different now because you're working with engineers. Yeah, no, I well, I, I'm again blessed in the fact that you know, I, I I joke. People always ask me how did I get into this, and I said, well, I'm just a better mousetrap person, uh, in that I always dreamed, uh, I always dream of there being a better way to do what I'm doing today, a more efficient and more effective way, hopefully to help patients, and so you know. I'm not an engineer by background, but I, I found my way into this discussion. I pursued a really high tech area of surgery. Um, but then, you know, the interactions have really kept that alive and growing and, and have been just a wonderful part of this. I, you know, I get the opportunity to work with brilliant engineers at, you know, Bob and all of his students and many other students uh, across the university and across uh, the medical center and trainees and all of that. And, and what I would say is I think there's a growing uh, need and desire for that. So my observation, I used to joke around that surgeons of old sort of stayed in one way of doing things. You know, it was sort of, there was dogma, there was, this is the way I've always done it. You have to learn it my way. That's it. And the only way we advance is to get out of that. Um, and so what I see happening is we're seeing a lot more surgeons gravitate to that as they see the changes within how we've practiced over the last two decades. And then also, I would I even say the influx of engineering background people into surgery and other disciplines. We're seeing a lot more people come through and enter those fields either after an undergraduate engineering uh, degree or sometimes a graduate engineering degree. And so they're really, I like to say, uh, extraordinarily multifunctional. You know, we have a young uh, person that joined our group who works with Bob and I, who did a fellowship with us and stayed on, who's got an engineering background, who's just killing it right now and doing great stuff. So that's where I see it. And then for me, it's just a great opportunity to, to sort of stay young and, and keep doing fun things with uh, really interesting and fun people. Yeah, it just seems like the injection of all this technology and stuff has been really a, a good way for surgeons to innovate. It makes the job fun, you know, really. Um, it's, yep. it's, it just seems the way it's going. Um, I guess looking back to Bob, kind of same question, but I guess I'm, I'm more interested in the students a little bit too, and some of those things that Duke said at the end there. I mean, have you seen some 
kind of really interesting, you know, realizations from the students where they feel like, whoa, this is a great innovation. Holy smokes. You know, I guess what, what have you seen in your experience with the students kind of getting involved in the OR and seeing things and really innovating things maybe that you didn't even realize? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the thing I love seeing is when students, when the light clicks on as far as what they want to do in a career. So, uh, well, I'll give you two examples. One is Rich Hendrick, who's now our chief operation officer and lead engineer at Virtuoso. So Rich came into grad school very focused. He knew he wanted to be in medical devices. He knew he wanted to uh, design new ones, and he thought he was going to work at a big company. Uh, he came into grad school, started doing great. I mean, was just doing great research from day one. Never had thought about being an entrepreneur. Thought that that was probably too risky. He probably wanted to go lead an R&D group in industry. Um, and so in grad school, he took a class, which I now teach, which teams up uh, engineers and business students and law students. So he took that class at my encouragement. And he, by working with those folks, he actually got the picture, hey, I can do this. I can be an entrepreneur. And this technology I'm working on is pretty cool and has the potential to make a really big impact. There are big markets here, big profits to be made. And I think I could do this. And so seeing him go from like the standard course of going and working in a big company to then saying, hey, I want to launch a company and be an entrepreneur and how successful he's been is really satisfying to me. And the other quick one I'll give you is another student of mine, Jenna Gorlowicz, who is now a tenured associate professor at St. Louis University um, and also leads innovation there. She's uh, working in the dean's office um, as the, the head of innovation. So she came into grad school not even really know, not having no idea what she wanted to do, certainly never thinking she wanted to be a professor. And she worked in, in Vice in lots of different, even before Vice existed, this was a few years ago, but in lots of different projects. So she kept moving around and she tried a bunch of different things and ultimately found what she really was passionate about, which was working with people. Educational stuff is what she wanted to do. She didn't know that when she came into grad school. And that set the stage for her to say, hey, a faculty career, if I want to work on educational projects and I like research, faculty career might be for me. And she's been fantastically successful. She has startup companies on the side. She's doing amazing things at St. Louis University. So seeing it's not always one moment, but it's the progression of figuring out what you're passionate about and what your career should be about. And I just love working with students through that whole process and helping them explore those things. Oh, that's fantastic. No, I, I think and a full disclaimer, one of my students took your course too, and she loved it too. So it was, it was awesome. So I think those are great opportunities. They're all here at Vanderbilt, which is great. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and go to a, a little different area here. You're both in the entrepreneurial world and, and um, you know, you, you have a lot of things to offer, I guess, in terms of, you know, potential hurdles and what, what are the challenges that are out there. You've discussed a little bit right there, Bob, even the idea of moving from, you know, ac an academic road to the entrepreneurial road. I guess there are any tips, tips of the trade in terms of or, or hurdles that you see or things that students should just kind of, you know, know ahead of time to, to, be, to be ready for, really. Well, I, I'm going to jump in there and say that, you know, what, what I recommend to almost every student who says the word entrepreneur, who's an engineer, is that they they uh, work, <laughs> work with Bob or take his class or and, and seriously, I mean, you know, when when I, I would say that when we started out in this, when I started out in this, there was no background in this. There was no training ground. There weren't people there weren't courses on how to, to develop medical devices and how to work your way through all this. And, and you know, kudos to Bob. He is not only developed devices and done this this work as many people at Vanderbilt are doing, but he's also willing to share it with other people and teach them about how to approach it, uh, which I think is just fantastic. And I think that's one of the bigger pushes I would say to anyone who's interested in being doing this program at Vanderbilt is, you know, the the uh, ecosystem at Vanderbilt around entrepreneurial development, especially medical device entrepreneurial development, I think is as robust uh, as anywhere in the country. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a few places that are widely regarded, and I, I think we're uh, amongst those few places, if not uh, hopefully in the lead. So. Yeah, to me, the, I mean, the biggest hurdles for people is just that you need to be a generalist if you want to do entrepreneurship or even if you want to run a lab. You need, and everybody comes into grad school knowing one or two things and uh, not knowing a whole bunch of others. If you want to do robotics, you got to know computer science. If you want to apply it to medicine, you got to know biomedical engineering. You got to know mechanical engineering if you want to make the build the robot. Um, and then if you want to talk about entrepreneurship and commercialization, you got to know business, you got to know law. So there is nobody comes with the full package. Everybody asks me, like, what do I have to know to work in your lab? And the answer is nothing. You know some things already and there's a million other things you got to learn. So that's the biggest thing is just being open to learning across a huge number of disciplines. 
Um, and then the biggest thing that I think that sets people apart is knowing how to choose the right problems to solve. And you get that from mentorship. All of the vice faculty are great at this. Not, I mean, this is by no means exclusive to us. Uh, Mike is wonderful at it, all of us. Like what it's you always as an engineer or a researcher, you have 50 different problems you could solve. And how do you pick the one of those that is the home run? It's very hard. A lot of people don't do it. It requires instincts, requires experience. You gain that through mentorship, through having faculty who have done it before, who guide your thinking and tell you how they think about these problems and approach these problems. And that really, to me, is the thing that sets apart the people who achieve dramatically amazing things and the people who achieve okay things, right? It's choosing the right problems. And I'll, I'll add in there that it's the same thing that makes great surgeons, uh, is they have to find a mentor or mentors, uh, and you have to learn your craft with them. And it is indeed a craft. Uh, and so I tell all surgeons, you know, you can be an entrepreneur, but you better go practice for a while first or you won't understand what the real problems are. So. Yeah. So, so that's, that's awesome. Um, so that's great. Uh, so you've, you've talked about the Vanderbilt entrepreneurial ecosystem. You all love it. You're doing great here. All that kind of stuff. I, I got to hit this last thing. Bob, you had a great recent a new award uh, from NIH called the REACH Award. That stands for Research Evaluation and Commercialization Hub. Um, this is going to have huge impact at Vanderbilt. Huge impact in the Middle South, really. Um, so I was wondering, can you talk a little bit about it and kind of what's going to happen in the coming years about that and how, how yep. it's going to impact the entire area, really, in Nashville? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a four-state network, first of all. It's, a, you know, not just Vanderbilt or just Tennessee. It's also Mississippi, Kentucky, and Virginia. And this program is open to everybody who works at any university, including community colleges, HBCUs, at anywhere in those four states. And what it is, is it's a $12 million grant. It's uh, 4 million from NIH. And then we have 8 million in matching funds from those universities, the state governments in those states uh, that are all being contributed in order to start new companies. So what happens is every six months, we'll give out 20 grants of $50,000 to people who want to start university or what are coming from university and want to start a company. Um, and that's seed funding that they can use to bridge this gap, because the biggest gap I've seen between companies failing is a PhD student graduates or a postdoc comes to the end of their training and they want to launch a company, but the idea of taking no salary for a year while you try to get this off the ground is daunting when you could go to industry and make over 100K. Um, and so we need a way to bridge those people. And that's why we wrote this proposal is to have that money so you can eat. I mean, it's not, not going to be a lavish lifestyle, but you can eat while you're building out the business model for your company. Um, <laughs> so every six months, we will be able to give out 20 grants uh, of this size, the renewable up to four times. So a given company could get 200,000 in seed funding out of this hub. Um, so super exciting way to be able to just generate a whole bunch of new companies and support people who otherwise might decide to take the safer, easier way and go to industry and just give them a little bit of an on-ramp into being entrepreneurs. Yeah, that's that's just like going to have a huge impact to the area. I think I think everybody's excited about it. I think it's, you know, what, what a great opportunity. Kudos to you and your colleagues for going after it. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, I think that is bringing us really to the end of the end of our 30 minutes here. So I think we're going to wrap it up right now. So, um, you know, I'd like to thank you both for your time. I know you're both busy. You both work in two jobs right now, basically making this, this company come to realization. And I, and I wish you great success in that. Um, but I really appreciate you coming on today and telling us all about the things that you're doing, kind of the impact that you're having, the company you generated, and then really the, the impact that you're having in the, the whole Middle South here, uh, really in Nashville in, in particular, especially the device industry, which I'm very pro. So that's great. Um, so la lastly, as a disclaimer, I always give a final disclaimer. I'm no expert MC at this stuff. I, I'm just an engineering researcher trying to do things. So as I always uh, tell my kids, you know, I'll do better next time. <laughs> uh, but thanks, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Bob and Duke, for uh, taking the time out to tell us about your, your kind of exciting venture. Thanks, everybody. Pleasure. Thanks, Mike. See you next time All right. in October.